Now, I have to begin, begin with a footnote, and that's that the basic outline for this sermon is from a book by a man named Roger Campbell. I did a little rearranging, and I filled out the outline in my own way, but credit for that concept and for the basic structure belongs to Mr. Campbell. But I hope that together that it'll wind up being a blessing for you. Now, the great uh, baseball pitcher, I need to hit B, don't I? There we go. That's right. The great uh, baseball pitcher, Satchel Paige, he's credited with the statement, don't look back, something might be gaining on you. And there's more wisdom in that statement than you might realize. There is a looking back that's detrimental to us. There's a looking back that can damage us. That truth is reflected in a bunch of pop phrases that we have. Put it behind you. Move on with your life. Stop living in the past. Get over it. Now those phrases, they all acknowledge that a backward look can taint one's present life experience. It can interfere with the pursuit of one's goals. It can hinder one's joy. And it can retard one's growth and development as a person. Now the Bible's quite clear that as Christians we need to look back frequently and intently on Jesus and the cross. In Ephesians chapter 119, Paul says that he's praying that they will grasp at a heart level the incomparably great power that God has exercised on their behalf. So Paul is praying for them to comprehend this more deeply. He wanted his readers to comprehend the magnitude of God's effort on their behalf. And he wanted them to do that because he knew that strength and power come from remembering what God has done in the past. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 13, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from you. It is the gift of God. It is not from works, so that no one may boast. For we are His product, having been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance in order that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember. See, therefore, remember that at one time you, the Gentiles in the flesh, those called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision done by human hands in the flesh, remember that at one time you were separate from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus... You who at one time were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So here we see him uh, explaining this to him. This realization. You see, Paul wants them to look back. He wants them to remember. He understands there's power in that. And this realization that remembering God's work in the past, in the past strengthens one for present living. That same realization is reflected in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 9. We're after listing various spiritual qualities in verses 5 through 8. Peter remarks, he says, But if anyone does not have them, does not have those spiritual qualities, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. See, remembering God's work on our behalf is so important that God has consistently provided ways for His people to remember. From Passover to the Old Testament feasts to the Lord's Supper, He has given us ways to look back and reflect and remember. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11.24, we're commanded to take the Lord's Supper in remembrance of Him. So this is something that's important. There, there are some other circumstances in which a backward look is needful and helpful. But Scripture also makes clear that there is a looking back. There is that kind of looking back that is detrimental or spiritually harmful. And we as Christians are not to engage in that kind of looking back. And you see this in what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through the first part of verse 15. 
He says, not that I already obtained this or already have been perfected, but I press on that I may indeed take possession of that for which I was also taken possession of by Christ Jesus. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken possession of it. But one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind and straining for the things ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of God's upward call in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are mature, think this way. Paul understood and he knew that he had not already reached the perfection that will be his at the resurrection. You see, final perfection cannot be expected in this life. It comes only at the consummation, only when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. See, only then will our transformation toward Christ's likeness be complete. And you see that pointed to and suggested in like 1 John 3, 2, Romans 8, 29, 1 Corinthians 15, 49, 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. But he pressed on in faithfulness. He knew that he had not attained the perfection that ultimately will be his. But he pressed on in faithfulness that he might take hold of the life for which Christ had taken possession of him. That's what Paul is doing. Paul ran the race of his Christian life with his eye fixed on the glory of unseen eternity. That's how Paul ran the race. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18, he says, Therefore we do not lose heart, but even if our outward man is being wasted away, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. For the lightness of our affliction, which is momentary, is producing for us far beyond all measure an eternal weight of glory as we focus not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. You see, he forgot. Paul was focused on that. He forgot the part of the track that he'd already covered. Paul forgot that. The life he'd already lived, and he focused on that part of the race that was before him. Paul kept his eyes focused on that. He lived his Christian life in the present rather than the past. And he says that all those who are mature should take that view. All who are mature, and in keeping with that example and admonition, we're not to look back. You see, we're not to look back on our old life outside of Christ, for example. Well, what kinds of backward looks are included in this thing where Paul says, I don't look back, but I keep focused? What kinds of negative backward looks are there? The kinds of things that mature Christians shouldn't be doing. Well, the first thing is that we're not to look back at our old life outside of Christ and see it as better than it was. You see, to cherry pick only the good experiences to create a, a falsely appealing, appealing picture of the past. You know how we can do that, right? The truth of the matter is that that old life was one of corruption and alienation from God. You know, I, I'm tempted to do that. Look at all the times that we had when I wasn't a Christian and think about those things. But the reality is, what was that life? It was corruption and alienation. Paul has the right perspective when he says in Philippians 3, 7 to 9, but what, thing were gain, what things were gains to me, these things I've considered loss on account of Christ. But even more so, I consider all things to be loss on account of the surpassing value of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, on account of whom I've lost all things. Indeed, I consider them dung that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Paul had all kinds of stuff. You know, he was rising above those of his own generation. You know that. And yet, as Paul became a Christian, he could look back on all those things that he could cherry pick. And he saw his life outside of Christ for what it was. It was one of alienation and corruption. You see, but the old life, the old life has a certain pull. 
one can certainly be tempted to return to that old life. I mean, that happened to Israel as during the Exodus. They look back longingly on the days in Egypt, right? You remember Numbers chapter 11, 18? We were better off in Egypt. Right? We were better off in Egypt. And Jesus knew certain, certainly knew it was something that, that could tempt the disciples. That's why he said in Luke chapter 9, verse 62, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. So one of the things backward looks, we cannot look back at our old life and see it as something better than it was and create it as some kind of great land or something like that that tempts us to want to turn back to it. But secondly, we're not to look back at past sins as though they haven't been forgiven. We are not to look back at past sins as though they haven't been forgiven. I cannot tell you how many people continue to flog themselves with guilt over yesterday's sins. I mean, the only sin that matters in a Christian's life is the one you intend to commit, not any that you've committed. You see, for those who've accepted God's sacrificial lamb, for those who've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a constant cleansing and washing of all sin. That's what John says in 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 to 9. If you're a Christian, whatever you have done, however often you may have done it, if this afternoon you are not clinging to that sin, refusing to repent of it, refusing to give up your intention to engage in it, well, then it's like it never happened. It's like it never happened. You see, as Isaiah 43, 25 says, God blots out our transgressions and remembers our sins no more. Well, if God has completely forgiven and forgotten your sin, why are you hanging on to it? Why? Brother, sister, why are you letting that dog you and consume you with guilt? Guilt is a favorite tool of the devil. It robs you of your joy of salvation, which makes you vulnerable to attack, and it hampers your witness to other people. You see, as a faithful Christian, God has forgiven you, and He intends for you to be released from your guilt. He intends for you to be liberated from your burden so you might rejoice in the magnificence of His mercy. See, that's what will motivate you to tell others about the great God you serve. What has He done? I had this thing that I had no way of getting rid of. There was no way for me to come out from this ton that was on me, and He has liberated me from that. Now, who is a God like that? You see, who is a God like that? And see, that's what will then tell you, I have to tell you about him. He is a liberating God. He has taken my guilt and he has freed me from what bound me. And you will be someone then who will be excited about sharing the great God that you serve. The third thing is that we're, we're not to look back at past failures and mope about what might have been. I mean, everybody's life, everybody's life is sprinkled with failures and defeats and disappointments. But nothing can be gained by dwelling on them. No good comes from that. That only leads to an excessive fear of failure that winds up paralyzing you. You see, if you constantly dwell on failures and those kinds of things... Well, then you become so afraid to step out and do anything because you're just certain that it's going to fail. So you, you wind up being paralyzed. It's the classic defeatist attitude that nothing's worth trying because it will never succeed. You're all familiar with the man who had less than three years of formal education, who'd failed in business in 1831, was defeated for the legislature in 32 again failed in business in 33, 
was elected to the legislature in 34, defeated for speaker in 38, defeated for elector in 40, defeated for Congress in 43, elected to Congress in 46, defeated for Congress in 48, defeated for the Senate in 55, defeated for the vice presidential nomination in 56, and defeated for the Senate in 58. That was Abraham Lincoln. So you see this idea of, of dwelling on past failures and letting that paralyze you so that you are defeatist and frozen and will not keep striking out and venturing and going forward because you feel now you've been flea trained. You know that idea of putting the flea in the cup and he bounces and bounces and then he quits and quits and quits because he's gotten convinced there's no point in it. Whether that's true or not, it's a nice illustration. <laughs> I figure a flea's too stupid to learn anything. <laughs> But you see that idea of being conditioned that way. Take the Apostle Paul's exhortation to heart. Whatever failures there may have been in the past, whatever disappointments you may have had, they are water under the bridge. I know that's easier said than done, but my job up here is to say it. <laughs> you see, they're water under the bridge. Tom Clancy, a well-known writer, he expresses the concept this way. Fix your eyes forward on what you can do, not back on what you cannot change. You see, strain for the things of he ahead. Push on in the power of God to be the person that He wants you to be. That is the mature Christian attitude. Looking ahead in the power of God, straining forward to be the person that God wants you to be. The fourth thing, we're not to look back at old conflicts or past mistreatment by other people. Rehashing old wounds. That will only make you bitter and angry, which is sinful. And it will rob you of the peace and joy God intends for you to have in Christ. We live in a culture of absolute victimhood. A culture that encourages us to dwell on every wrong that has ever been done to us throughout our lives and then to use that as an excuse for not being who we should be or doing what we should do. And it's damaging. This is just a modern version of self-pity. That's what that is. And Satan will exploit that spirit and that attitude in a heartbeat. As somebody has said, Satan's invitation is, come unto me, all you who are grieved, peeved, misused, and disgruntled, and I will spread on the sympathy. You will find in me a never-failing source of the meanest attitudes and the most selfish sort of misery. At my altar, you may feel free to fail and fall and there to sigh and fret. There I will feed your soul on fears and indulge your ego with envy and jealousy, bitterness and spite. There I will excuse you from every cross, duty and hardship and permit you to yield to temptation. You see, he will take that attitude, that focusing on all these wrongs, that attitude of self-pity. I've had this done to me. I've been there. And make that the center of your life. And he will take your life and throw it in the trash the whole time you're talking that way. He'll say, that's right. That's right. That, yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, you're off the board. You're off the battlefield. Because you're just absorbed with what's happened to you. It shouldn't have happened. But you have to get on with the business. You have to do that and look ahead. And lastly, we're told not to look back, or, or we, we're not, we are not this idea of looking back, what are the detrimental things? We're not to look back at old victories. You see, at old victories that may cause us to think that we've arrived, and then to rest on our success. Dwelling on past accomplishments, that can make you complacent in your Christianity. It can give you this sense, well, that I've been there, done that. I've already done this, and I can now retire from the active pursuit of Christ-likeness. But that's not, that's not how it should be. The late W.B. West, I'm sure Anthony knows W.B. The late W.B. West, 
He told during a chapel at Harding Graduate School, now called the Harding School of Theology, he told how someone had asked the great artist, Leonardo da Vinci, which was his greatest painting. And da Vinci's reply was, the next one. You see, and that's Paul's attitude. That's Paul's attitude in Philippians chapter 3. This great soldier of Christ, I dare say, had done far more in service of Jesus than any of us in this room. Paul had given his life and been kicked all over the Mediterranean world to tell people about Jesus Christ. But he refused to be lured into complacency by his, his glowing resume. He was looking ahead. He was looking to the next one. Then that's how we should be. All of the things, we can't change what's happened in the past. That's just something that is used to hinder our fighting in the present. See, we are to be people who are focused and striving and seeking. And not to be distracted and not to be having these kind of inappropriate backward looks. Look back to Jesus. Look back to the cross. Remember what God has done for us. But don't do this kind of looking back that is harmful and detrimental and contrary to the spiritual life of a mature Christian. We are to be focused and looking ahead. None of us know how much time we have left in this world. And Bill's passing last week, that certainly reminds us of that. None of us knows how much time we have left. And in running the race that is the Christian life, we, like Paul, we are to, for, are to forget the part of the track we've already covered, and we are to focus on the finish line, just looking like this, living like this, straining like that. Paul doesn't dwell on past accomplishments. He doesn't dwell on failures in his ministry, but he strains to be faithful till death. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to be faithful till death in the energy and the power that God works in me by the Spirit. I want to serve him till my last breath. And that's what Paul is doing. He labors to finish the race so that he might gain the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6-8, through 8, which I preached on in the not-too-distant past. That's, all, that's how life gets categorized now. The far past, the not-too-distant past, and right now. But I preached on that in the not-too-distant past. But it's a kind of commentary, really, on Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 15, that's delivered right next to the finish line. And Paul writes there, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure has arrived. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. May that be the way we are, brothers and sisters. Come, we enter the land.